You know, there's always been magic attached to the forests of the old world. For most of us, Sherwood Forest still rings with the swish of Robin Hood's arrows and the clash of sword on sword. And in the Black Forest of Germany, witches still wait in gingerbread houses for children like Hansel and Gretel. And farther east, in the bleak Carpathian Mountains, the ruins of Castle Dracula rise, always prepared for the master's return. Europe isn't what it used to be. Of course, most of its forests were cut and used up nearly 400 years ago. So when we think of modern Europe, we seldom think about forests, except for those that fuel our fantasies. But I know of a place in the north of Yugoslavia where the Draba River flows into the Danube. It's a place where the morning mist lies thick and heavy on the landscape and wintry trees reach out like clutching fingers. On the other hand, when the mist dissolves, we find ourselves on less forbidding ground. In fact, we are right in the middle of one of the world's most spectacular wildlife refuges. And of all the wildlife in this place, there is none quite as spectacular as the European red deer. And they are never more spectacular than they are right now. October sunlight filters through the early morning mist. The enchanted forest lies suspended between the cold of night and the heat of day. Wild boar are early risers, rooting out dew worms. But the great stag has no interest in food. He is consumed with a mating urge. Each day he scratches out his personal turf. And answers the bellows of unseen challenges, rivals for his females. Today's challenger arrives, shouting his defiance. The ruling stag responds in kind. And so the annual rut goes on. This is nature's most awesome duel, its purest contest of strength and endurance. The stags are literally locked in combat. The clash begins to draw a crowd, a colorful male pheasant and his not-so-colorful females. Sometimes the duel ends quickly, but this one could last all day. It distracts a hunting fox. But other creatures have other priorities. How do hedgehogs mate? Like porcupines, very carefully. Rutting stags don't fight to the death, but death is always a possibility. The male hedgehog finally takes his leave, but passion seems to have made him crazy. He waddles directly at the hungry fox. But if you're protected by a coat of sharp quills, even a hungry fox will leave you alone. At least she certainly will the next time. The enchanted forest lies within one of the world's great waterfowl areas. More than 300 species flock here to this northern corner of Yugoslavia. No bird needs to go hungry in the marshlands called Kopatsky Rit. So far, this little egret can still get by despite her broken wing. The fishing birds of Kopatsky Rit have learned the advantages of working together. They swirl en masse just above the surface of the water driving the fish into the shallows. The rest is as easy as bobbing for apples. The 
the blue heron makes it look even easier. So does the crippled egret, despite her handicap. But the good life here will soon be gone. A whisper of winter is in the air. The stags are still locked in their epic struggle, seven hours after the first clash of antlers. The right to mate is not easily won. Beyond the forest, the water birds are massing, and they're feeding up for their southern migration. Some will winter in the Persian Gulf, others as far away as Central Africa. But the little egret won't be leaving. She can't fly with her mate this fall. Only one stag can win, but occasionally both will lose. Their antlers tangle. They can't ever separate. They starve together. But not this time. The females don't care who wins. They don't care who loses. Their only interest is reproduction. And one stag is pretty much the same as another. The spoils of victory are fleeting. But the spoils of defeat can be terribly permanent. The great old stag has fought one long battle too many. He has lost his does to a younger, stronger rival. A dozen autumns have come and gone since he first became a champion. Scores of offspring carry his bloodline throughout the enchanted forest. But his best days are behind him now. His proud old heart will carry him no farther. A similar fate almost surely awaits the abandoned and grounded egret. But wait, perhaps she won't die alone. Her mate is coming back. But their reunion may be short-lived. A great danger hovers in the gathering storm clouds. It's not the storm the animals fear, but what the storm might bring. The enchanted forest is tinder dry. One bolt of lightning can set it ablaze. The worst that can happen, does happen. Suddenly, fire is blowing wild. Some creatures try to run. Others try to hide. The fear of fire is inborn, instinctive, almost as old as life itself. The fox displays remarkable calm, but the panicked boars have blundered into a circle of flame. The fleet red deer will outrun the fire, unless the fire walls them in. When we think of forest fires, we think of horrible disaster, of wildlife fleeing before a wall of flame. That is a true picture. But it's not the only true picture. Forest fires do take a heavy toll on wildlife, but massive destruction always leads to massive renewal. Fire clears the forest of deadfall and debris. It makes way for new growth. When our ancestors arrived in America, they believed the great eastern forest had been standing there since time began. In fact, great fires had swept them away about once every hundred years. Sometimes, of course, a natural wildfire goes completely out of control. There was one in Siberia in 1915 that raged for 50 days. 
More than 600,000 square miles were torched, and the smoke clouded an area roughly the size of Europe. We can control forest fires much better now. The water bomber especially has made a major difference, and sometimes we can even prevent them. But we can't stop the lightning and we can't stop the rain. The enchanted forest is in serious danger, and so are all of its creatures. A lonesome eagle floats across the fire-reddened sky. The flames eat hungrily through a generation of underbrush and nature's own garbage dump on the forest floor. The deer are boxed in. And ironically, only the storm itself can offer salvation. The light rain sizzles on a boar that didn't make it. But a light rain is too little rain. And for some creatures, it's much too late. Only a downpour can fight this fire. And finally, that downpour arrives. The fire sputters and dies. The deer did manage to outrun the flames. And thanks to the rain, the fire never reached the crippled egret and her loyal mate. Life resurfaces, and the enchanted forest moves forward into winter. The stags have lost their competitive urge. It disappeared with the rut. Winter survival is rarely a problem for the deer of Kapachkirit. They may have to walk a little more gingerly, but there's plenty of food to go around. Even the egrets manage to find tender morsels here and there. In February, the majestic stags don't look so majestic anymore. They shed their antlers and most of their dignity. Those who have the most to lose, always lose it first. The crippled egret has defied nature's law that only the fittest survive. It's her loyal mate, in fact, who failed to make it through. It's only February. There's still a lot of winter left. An ungainly stork distracts her from her lonely vigil. So does a minor squabble over food. The little egret shivers with cold and hunger, but she has not lost her will to survive. She still reacts to every threat. Fortunately, the fox has designs on some nice fat geese. They manage, however, to uh, give him the slip. The survivor has survived yet another threat. And along the shore, where the ice is thin, she finds enough fish to keep her going. Now the barren trees have begun to bud, and the egret seems to sense an end to her loneliness. Spring floods back into the Kopatskirit. Yugoslavia's winter gives way graciously. Waterfowl swarm back from the south, back to the one who couldn't leave. They pick right up where they left off last fall. And she is eager to rejoin the gang. The stags are regaining their male identity. And the male egrets are displaying theirs. When they go a-courting, it's what's up top that counts. A doe peels afterbirth from her newborn fawn. 
a second doe ambles in for a look. There is more to this ritual than just a cleanup. Each female learns to recognize her youngster by smell, just as every fawn learns to recognize its mother by smell. The wild boar sow builds her own birthing nest. Mother gets in a few more licks. When her newborn fawn is safely asleep, she'll treat herself to a nice breakfast. The crippled egret has found herself a new fella. They seem to be getting along just fine. So do the newborn and hungry little boars. While the doe regains her strength, her fawn and a friend are testing theirs. Because escape is the deer's best defense, fawns are running within hours of birth. Running and playing their gentle fawn games. Unlike the little boars whose games are rarely gentle. Somebody is not where he should be. In fact, he's not sure where he is. This crowd looks friendly. Mother should be around here somewhere. Oh, no, that's not her. When you're only a day or so old, it's hard to tell a stag from a doe. And if you try to nurse a young male, don't expect him to stand still for it. Mother's search is growing desperate. The fawn has got himself seriously lost. She knows he needs her milk, and soon. It's his only source of nourishment for weeks. Little boars start to grub for food early. But every newborn mammal relies on mother's milk. Without it, the very worst can happen. In the enchanted forest, starvation and sickness are the major predators. She sniffs the dead fawn, but it isn't hers. He is still alive, but he's still lost. If she doesn't find him pretty soon, he could easily suffer the dead fawn's fate. She calls and calls again. This time, he hears her. And does he ever like what he hears? All is right with his world once again. And all is right in the egret's world, too. Despite the odds against her, she overcame her handicap and produced new life. You see, miracles still happen in the new wilderness. The man who filmed the enchanted forest which you've just seen calls it the last oasis. He spent three full years there hunched behind his hidden camera. And when Peter Lalovich re-emerged, he came out with more than just wonderful pictures. He became obsessed with Kopachki Rit and fearful that its days might be numbered by the future intrusion of man. We North Americans tend to take our wildlife areas for granted. They're a luxury we can afford. But that's not the case in Europe, where most of the best land was already in use before the new world was more than a dream. Yugoslavia is not a rich country, and Kapachki Rit can bring in foreign currency. Once the enchanted forest was a favorite hunting ground of the legendary Marshal Tito. Now it's attracting sportsmen from the wealthy West with their dollars and marks and pounds. And that's why Peter Lalovich fears for his last oasis and for his country's last contact with the new wilderness. Thank you.